Before we get to the main feature, I figured I would include a little disclaimer. I'm going to be talking about devices that do have the potential to cause harm, either through high voltage shock or x-ray exposure. When used as designed in a typical commercial application, the x-ray radiation is zero or very minimal, but it is possible. So, with that in mind, let's get to it. Hey guys, it seems uh, you like the idea for the new segment. Still haven't settled on a name yet, and I'm not officially starting it yet, but I wanted to address a few of your great comments. I got a lot of encouragement and ideas and so on. So, uh, first off, <laughs> I got one comment about me um, being camera shy. Uh, no, I'm not. I think I mentioned this like in my first video blog or something. That, uh, no, typically I'm not on camera for a few reasons. One, I'm usually by myself, so I'm holding the camera. And I don't have a ton of time to make videos, so often I just grab the camera, I point it at whatever I want to talk about, and that's that. And yeah, it takes a little bit of time if I want to do myself with lighting and maybe comb my hair and put on a clean t-shirt and, and so on. Uh, and the original intent of the channel more than a decade ago was to um, show something that maybe people hadn't seen before uh, and to document the progress on some of my projects. Well, that was about it. I was... Honestly, had no idea how much interest it would generate that I'd be doing this so many years later, but here we are. Also was surprised at how much interest was sparked by these high voltage tubes, so that's what this installment is going to be about, because I just scratched the surface. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few things. One, you know, I looked at the structure of uh, 1B3s a little more closely. For example, here's one an early type, it's got a ring around the bottom. So I don't think what I said was inaccurate that, and here's another one that has a big ring around the base, I don't think what I said was inaccurate that the 1K3, 1J3 are less prone to short out, but I don't think the mechanism that prevents that is that ring. I think there's an internal structure um, that uh, helps support it, so Take a quick look. So here's a typical early 1B3. There are two posts that go up inside and support the filament. Typically a 1J3, which I currently have in my hand, it seems to have a more beefy support structure. So one thing I want to do in this video, something you've never seen me do before, which is to break some tubes. I've got some 1B3, 1G3s, and 1K3s, and 1J3s that are pretty well used up. So, because uh, it's difficult to see what's up under inside there and see the actual filament, we're going to break one of each open and see what's actually inside to find out for sure what's going on. Because you won't find this talked about in the dated books, not the ones I've looked at. They show you the envelope dimensions, they show you the filament voltage and current, the peak ratings. Nothing about the actual features of the tube. Maybe advertising literature did, but I haven't come across any of that. There's only in a data book that says, like, hey, the 1J3 is superior to 1B3's because, and then lists some features. There's just nothing. The specs seem pretty much identical to me. Um, so something else, uh, 1B3s and 1G3s. So back in the early days, like this is a 1B3 GT. These came out, I think, 1946. Sometime not long thereafter, these started getting shorter. So even though this is an early one, it's not as tall as the earliest ones I've seen. I'm trying to find one. I know I got some that are marked 8016 and then 1B3 GT. 8016, I think, was the industrial uh, number for it. Those are even taller than these. It seems like the only difference with the 1G3 is that they're shorter. Uh, for sure all the ones that are marked 1B3, 1G3 are short. And the ones that are marked just 1G3 are short. 
and 1B3s I've seen quite a range of height on them. Well for starters here's some more tubes. So this is a straight up 1B3, a straight up 1G3. Notice the height difference. But also notice internally they each just have two vertical supports for the filament. Well here is a 1K3, a couple of different types of 1K3. This one has four vertical supports. And this one has, looks like three. Two of them are kind of welded together. And of course they're short. So I think that that is the real difference is they have a beefier support structure. It's not the ring around the bottom. Now I'm going to pull out a whole bunch more rectifier types because uh, I just scratched the surface. There's a whole big variety of them, including these guys, which we'll talk a bit more about. And as a lead into that, we're also going to talk about radiation. So, that is a topic that back in the day I think was not very well understood and overblown, and it persists to this day, I think partly because back then it was overblown. So, X-ray radiation. Yes, if you look up the specs for a 1B3 GT, they will give warnings for uh, that, that these tubes are, can produce X-rays. That is true under certain circumstances. These tubes are rated up to 30,000 plus volts. Your typical black and white TV of the late 40s, early 50s runs on between maybe 8 and 12,000 volts. X-rays don't really start getting produced until you hit about 25,000 volts. You don't get into that until you get into color TVs, and color TVs didn't use these. So your normal consumer appliances use a 1B3, would never get anywhere near that much voltage. But these were used in industrial applications. Like negative ion generators, or the, they were medical devices back then that would uh, create high voltage, and of course laboratory equipment. So under the right circumstances, theoretically these are capable of producing x-rays. However, they would get produced under this dome. So, I mean, even then they'd be soft x-rays, and how many could actually escape from this? They'd be extremely minimal. So what prompted that scare. There are no x-rays coming out of the face of a CRT. Never were, never never have been. Um, the only thing that can really produce them in any measurable significant quantity in a TV are these type tubes. In particular 6BK4, the first generation. This is actually a later generation one where they minimize that effect. What is this? Well, most early TVs did not have any regulation on the high voltage supply. So when a scene got really bright, the high voltage would actually droop. There are some notable exceptions like the Dumont Clifton that actually has feedback and it's a regulated high voltage supply. That was really unusual for a black and white TV. When color TVs came out, suddenly it was important because um, they really had to drive those hard because of the, the mask and the phosphors used, they needed a lot more voltage to produce a watchable image. And they needed to regulate it so the colors wouldn't fade with, as the brightness varied. And to get uh, good purity and convergence, I imagine. Enter these. This is actually a triode, but it's a special kind of triode that can work at really high voltages. And this is what they use to regulate it. Kind of like a Zener diode, sort of, kind of. So the high voltage produced would be like in excess of 30,000 volts, and this would regulate it down to 22, 25-ish thousand volts. These could produce x-rays. The early version, the first version that came out. I've seen some stories, I've read some stories, some anecdotal evidence. I don't know what sounded the alarm that it was actually an issue. But once it got out into the public, People got scared, it was 
uh, promoted, um, talked about a lot. So the manufacturers scrambled to come up with solutions. Some they did just put a, like a, a shield around this whole high voltage area. They put warnings on it. Here are some more examples of the 6BK4 slash 6EL4. These are again of the later supposedly safer versions. I don't know exactly what they changed. I haven't been able to dig up one of the first generation dangerous tubes. Notice this one's a bit discolored. Uh, I don't know if that's because they put something in the glass to help block the x-rays or did it get discolored over time because of x-rays or just other high voltage phenomena. Uh, but it's not unusual to see tubes used in harsh environments, uh, high voltage environments where they, they look a little yellowy or a little weird. So that was one thing they did. They re-engineered some of the tubes. Now they also did it with the black and white tubes, the 1B3s. You may have seen over the years on my channel some that looked like this. Where it's got a white band around it. Some have a green band. Again, I don't know 100% for sure because I don't, I haven't seen it spelled out in the data sheets what that exactly, what that substance is, what exactly it does, how effectively it does it, but I do believe it is there to help block x-rays. Personally, I'm not the slightest bit concerned about x-rays. Uh, none of the sets I work on, with the exception, I guess, of the one color roundy I have, none of them even come close to producing enough voltage to be of concern. And even the ones that potentially could, if you have the early version of 6BK4, from the set, front of the set, there's like no measurable quantity. You need to get right up on it and spend a lot of time right next to it to like really get any kind of noticeable exposure and even then it's like way less than any like a dental x-ray so don't worry about it certainly watching a tv no it's like that's just uh, something to like scare kids or whatever you don't ruin your eyes you're not going to get irradiated watching a vintage tv now what we have here is a little history of high voltage rectifiers Let's start in the upper left with the one that I think started it all, which is the 2X2, also known as an 879. I believe the pre-war TVs and early oscilloscopes all used this. And typically they didn't have flybacks back then. This was directly off the, uh, the transformer. They would have a special high voltage 2 volt winding for the filament and for the plate. And uh, they could produce a lethal combination of voltage and current. Where typically these with the flyback, they're pretty high impedance and current limiting. You could get a shock, but these typically, but the load that your body would present would drop the voltage so much it wouldn't be lethal. But not so much with these. You can really see the structure in there. The filament and then a big gap to the plate. And a big mica insulator on top quite a bit of distance between the two. Later they went to this um, with the complete shroud covering the filament maybe to improve the efficiency, uh, decrease the voltage drop. This is an early 1B3, that's what they used right after that. These came out in about 46. It's a nice Motorola one with the early Motorola squiggle logo. New old stock. And here's the RCA one I showed earlier. And then we progress to the 1G3 and uh, the 1J3 and 1K3 I showed earlier. Uh, these up here, like this guy, the 1X2, were also used in some early sets. Uh, I think the earliest instance I saw it is a 1949 Admiral. Well, the Bakelite 10 inch sets. These could not, these were good at up to like 30,000 volts. This is not, but again, TVs didn't go up that high. They would maybe run on 9,000 volts. So this one is good enough for that. So sim similar 1 volt filament and a cap on top for the plate. 
Then we get into color TVs. And typically you have two high voltage rectifiers in those. One for the main anode on the CRT and be something like a 3A3, 3A3A in this case, or 3A3C. And they also had one for the electrostatic focus voltage, which may have been, uh, I don't know, five, six, seven thousand volts, something like that. For that, they might use one of these guys, a 1V2. Basically to save cost, I believe, because why use a big old tube like this when this is good enough? You don't need that minuscule current for an electrostatic uh, focus setup, like microamps. Um, this is another type, a 2AV2. And then this guy, since uh, you're only using two of these pins for the filament, why even have the other pins? So let's just dispense with them all together and reduce any chance of shorting. So just do filaments and the plate on top. So 1AY2. Now some of these uh, color sets needed some pretty beefy voltage and current. So these started getting more and more ruggedized and they typically ran on 3 volt filaments, so they get a little bit more uh, current going through them. It was a 3CX3, and they feel heavy. These might have leaded glass in them, or it's certainly thicker glass. And then the later style, they uh, shave some manufacturing costs off. Instead of having the full big light base, they went with like a, a pressed button base. Then eliminated some pins. If you're not going to use them, why have them? Typically you'd want to have a few on there just to hold the tube in its place, but to eliminate some to reduce chances of shorting and arcing. Again, uh, that is a heavy tube. And these do have x-ray warnings on them, typically. X-ray warning, this tube in operation may produce harmful radiation unless it is shielded. It's a 3DB3 tube. And then finally, this bad boy, which I have not looked up yet, it's a 3B2 CBS. It's huge. I don't know if it's from a TV or not, I suspect it is. Two more tubes before we get to the big finale, where I'm going to bust a couple of these open. These, I believe, are kind of the end of the, of the line for high voltage rectifier tubes and televisions. Both of these have uh, some measure of x-ray protection built in. On my computer here, I've got a, uh, the data sheet for the one DG3. And yeah, it says, features of the 1DG3A include built-in X radiation shielding and additional design and specification controls to reduce the radiation output to very low levels. So, this can sub for a 1B3, a 1G3, a 1J3, a 1K3. I don't know exactly what year it came out. Uh... But this is certainly a late example of it just by going by the construction style with the, the button base. It's kind of the last version of octal tubes they made. This one uh, looks a bit used. So just by glancing at it, I'm not sure what exactly they changed. The structure at the bottom looks a little different. It also feels heavier. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here's a 1B3 is an early type. This weighs, may, this weighs maybe twice as much as this, even though it's smaller. So there's some going on in here. I did see a comment online that they thought the bell, the anode bell, may be made out of lead or lead-plated. I'm not so sure about that. I'm thinking it's more the glass that's used. Take a quick scan here. I don't think they tell you what exactly they did. 
But man, there's a whole, but man, there's pages. If you look at the data sheet for a 1B3, it's like half a page. <laughs> this has two pages just on x-ray. So my point being that this is when the public, um, there was kind of a, a scare about x-rays. Which leads us to this bad boy. This is the ultimate. The ultimate in x-ray uh, hype over-engineering, shielding, and so on. The 3DR3. Bam! Oh, look at that guy. So, what is that outside jacket? You may have guessed already. That's lead, or a, a lead-infused substance, anyways. And you can imagine this. This has some heft to it. So yeah, the ultimate solution was let's encase the entire tube in uh, an eighth of an inch of lead shielding. <laughs> Which is a little silly, as I mentioned earlier, the, the real source of x-ray radiation, as far as I know, at least in TVs, was from the uh, regulator tube, not the rectifier tube. And similarly, this data sheet ver reads very much like the other, where they mention that it has uh, protective shielding, and there's several pages about X-ray radiation, and how they measured it, and what to be aware of, and the warnings, and all that. There's also a warning about this, about washing your hands after handling it. Uh, and, well, basically not to eat it, because <laughs> it contains lead oxide, and it's toxic by ingestion, so don't go eating one of these. Alrighty, we have a 1G3 slash 1B3 and a 1K3 that look extremely similar from the outside. Let's see what's inside. Sorry about the background noise. AC is on. So that will be the 1B3. So, here is the plate anode. It's just, there's nothing inside. It's just like a big, uh, big cup, big thimble. And there is the filament. So what can happen is these is that breaks, the loose end swings around and shorts into the bell. So let's see what's different about the 1K3, if anything. So the top thimble is the same. And as far as this structure, oh yeah, there's like a safety cage around the filament. So the filament is suspended in the middle and then on three sides there is a continuous metal bar and this one has a bit of a gap for some reason. Oh yeah, so it's going to one end of the filament. You can't short into the others, of course. So there you have it. Since none of the data books talk about this, and you can't see it when the anode is on, I had to sacrifice a couple tubes to finally find out what the difference is between these two. And I uh, hope it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyways, don't try this at home, and if you do, wear safety goggles and, and such. Well, that's going to be it for this installment. I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look at some high-voltage rectifiers, regulators, and their internal construction, uses, and the potential for x-ray exposure. Bye for now.